As an aquaculture business owner, how do you tackle the balance in being able to run a sustainable business and being profitable at the same time? That's what we're going to be talking about in this episode. Welcome to episode 7 of the Business of Aquaculture. This episode, I'm honored to have Mr. Brian Takeda, who is the founder and CEO of Urchinomics. Urchinomics is in the business of restorative aquaculture, ecologically destructive sea urchins are fished, ranch and turned into high-value seafood. As a result, Urchinomics helps kelp forest recover. This in turn brings marine biomass and diversity back to coastal ecosystems, sequesters carbon dioxide, and creates meaningful employment in rural and coastal communities. Welcome to the show, Brian. Hi. Thank you for taking time to be here today. Oh, I appreciate the opportunity. So listen in and I hope you enjoyed this episode. And let me start by asking, how did you get into the aquaculture industry? Okay. Uh, well, my my journey is is quite different to everyone else. Uh, I've, I've never actually been involved that much in aquaculture fisheries. I, I was born in a prefecture in Japan. It's one of the few that has no access to the sea. Uh, so I, I just don't have those really cool dramatic stories about, you know, being born in the ocean. But no, it's not that. It was just uh, uh, in uh, 2011, I had an opportunity to meet a number of Japanese fishers uh, uh, that were affected by the tsunami and uh, when uh, sorry it was 2012 uh, and uh, and uh, when I had a chance to meet them they told me about getting back on their feet but they said it wasn't really about the lost boats or the houses or the destruction the tsunami caused it was actually the ecological destruction it caused that was the the, the core the tsunami washed away the predatory species that kept sea urchins in check so when they got back with their new boats and their houses, the urchins exploded in population, overgrazed the entire kelp forest, which was the foundation of their of the fisheries. And so they had no fish to catch. And so that's the first time I really got to understand, oh, okay, sea urchins can be a problem. And that's how I kind of got more involved into the idea of using uh, Norwegian aquaculture technologies and, and trying to convert uh, these urchins into uh, a premium delicacy while removing them from the ocean and allowing the kelp forest to recover. Wow, it's quite actually dramatic about that. <laughs> <laughs> about how you got started. That's one thing I like about interviewing people in this podcast is that some of them are either born into it or somebody like you did who just basically bumped into the opportunity of helping and be of value to other people's challenges. In your case, with the urchin, I guess. Yes, no, I, I think you're right. I, I I didn't really envision in my career development that I'd be playing with prickly sea creatures. Uh, but uh, but you know, there's also a, a rather calculated uh, opportunity we're seeing here when you see how much work we as a as a civilization need to do to reverse the ecological damage that we've been doing on this planet for hundreds of years you know there are various solutions out there but the ones that have some of the greatest impact are out at sea uh, i mean the ecosystem services that a kelp forest provides are five times greater than a tropical forest and 10 times greater than a boreal forest so that's how much impact restoring one hectare of kelp forest does. So it's just a pure math, right? You know, limited resources, do what you can to, to get the best outcome. And surprisingly, the coastal ecosystems are one of the most important yeah, uh, ecosystems we have on the planet that are definitely worth restoring. I love it. I just am glad that there are a lot of people like you out there who, you know, they say love mother nature and mother nature love you back. In, in our case, being in business just produces a value for people. Right. I, I think, though, that that I mean, we're, we're also uh, I mean, on one hand, we have that idealism you know, deep within us, but we're also very pragmatic and recognize that economics still drives a lot of things in our world. So it's, it's for that reason, our our whole concept is built on a sustainable economic business as well, because no matter how much theory you talk about, you know, uh, all the good you can do, if it's not economically sustainable, it just becomes a grant project that disappears over time. So, you know, Urchinomics is really founded on the idea that we're going to pre produce a very premium delicious seafood product which we have validated in the toughest market like in Tokyo and Japan so uh you know we're, we're confident that the model uh, can deploy now the question is can our model deploy effectively in other regions around the world where we also have urchin parents and that's part of the work that we're doing today sounds good and it looks like you're already gaining traction you're all over the news with the last funding that you guys got and like what I said you do good 
to Mother Nature, good business will come to you. So congratulations. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. We're very lucky. I mean, uh, Enos is, is, is Japan's largest energy provider, and they are on a, on a mission to decarbonize as quickly as possible. And essentially, what they've discovered is that they can't buy enough forests to offset their activities. So they need to stimulate new decarbonization projects. So we happen to be their best choice in terms of ocean related stuff. So yeah, no, they're, they're very much pushing uh, decarbonization, and they're putting their money where their mouth is. They're essentially saying every uh, carbon uh, uh, sequestration opportunity we can create, they are willing to pay full market prices for that uh, blue carbon credit, even if it's voluntary. So Brilliant. That just gives us more resources to reinvest into restoration. Brilliant. So I know you're in a way like me, I entered this is fear because I married my husband, as you know, who's into aquaculture and like you who bumped into the fisherman who needed the help. What did you think are the pros and cons in being in this is fear? Let me see. Uh, from a, from a non aquaculture background, what I think is really exciting about this space uh, is that to get uh, an effective level of protein from aquaculture seems far more efficient than anything that we can do uh, in agriculture. Uh, I think one of the <laughs> one of the scientists told me the the, the 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 big difference between fish and 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 land animals is that fish can float. And they don't expend energy to, you know, stay upright or keep their body warm. So they're just inherently efficient proteins compared to land animals. Um, so, so I, I think there's a lot of just inherent efficiencies that come with aquaculture that that we just don't see in in, in ag. Um, uh, but I, I think the challenges, though, is that agriculture has had several thousand years of history. And, and regulatory rules were built around that evolution, where aquaculture has been kind of, it's a relatively new concept, at least in the West. And so the regulatory, the, the rules that are being applied are sometimes a, a lot more constrictive than they probably should be when you're trying to develop a nascent uh, industry. Uh, it's out of, it's, it's coming from somewhere good, because it's about, you know, let's not make the same mistakes we did with agriculture and aquaculture. So on that sense, I think it's a good thing. But I think at times we are being a little too restrictive and preventing some of the good things from happening. And, and you know, urchinomics, I think, is a good example. Uh, we like to think that that we are a net positive. Uh, I mean, the more we get urchins out of the oceans, the more the, the kelp forests recover and the environment gets better. Uh, having said that, though, we run into many regulatory challenges that prevent us from deploying. So we're, we have to be careful where we uh, put in our, our development efforts, because at one point in time, we could run into a wall that says, oh, you know what, everything looks good. We all love you and everything that's great. But oh, you run a foul paragraph four to a section one. And <laughs> no, we can't do it. And that's after three years of lobbying. And, and right. we've had that experience before. So it's like, you know, uh, it what it does is that when we deploy our sites or when we think about where we're going to build our next sites, uh, we have to be a bit cynical and, and see where not cynical, uh, realistic and, and, and focus on the, the jurisdictions that will allow us to do this as opposed to pulling up some weird old regulation that's going to you know, stop us at the last minute. Well, I don't I know if that answered the question. But. It did. It did. It. It. De I definitely feel your pain, as you know. We're in Canada, <laughs> and so we're in the same boat. And I would like to think my background is an auditor. So instead of being cynical, we have actually an accounting principle on being professional skeptics. <laughs> ah, fair enough. <laughs> no, but that's that's a healthy approach. I mean, uh, I, I've now been living in Norway for about, almost eleven years now, and and I think the the significant difference that I see from a, from a business culture perspective here is the the country here is very much a, a trust but verify approach it's not like the uh, you're innocent until proven guilty approach right. which i think is more you know north american um and, and so there are a lot of systems in place to keep things in check uh and i think that is a good principle to have it's just that um i guess in in terms of aquaculture i think i think the standards are quite different to other industries because maybe it's more nascent uh so yeah i think sometimes we need to take a step back look at the big picture and say, hey, you know, is this rule really what we need right now? You know? Absolutely. And I think this is one of the things that I've learned since I've interviewed 
quite a number of people and it's in the same boat. And if you believe it, you know, I'm in an in Vancouver Island where in we have quite a number of wineries in here. And when I was doing my promotion for the Sustainable Business 5.0, that's one of the biggest challenges that they're having. Can you believe actually that Vancouver Island wineries cannot sell their wineries to even other parts of Canada? They actually, people from, right, <laughs> from Montreal can actually order wines from Argentina and people here from Vancouver Island cannot sell it to Montreal people. So <laughs> it was ridiculous, but I wow. hear what you're saying. Yeah. So, and I guess it's not just in the aquaculture industry, but in the, mm. in the other industries as well. And I'm bringing a point here why I mentioned that it's because I think now that we're in, you're from Japan, so you probably already know society 5.0 is about imagination society and a lot of the structures, including government and institutions, even banking, especially after COVID hits, that mm. it's getting obsolete. And so it's, I guess now time to probably have more people talk about how we can update the ruling so that it can be more like what you mentioned I love what you mentioned about trust then verify and then it helps people to actually be more effective in trying to do their job or their business for that matter no oh, fair, fair enough uh, I, I I think but no in, in all fairness though I think the aquaculture industry in general uh, needs to be better at communicating what we do uh, you know, I, one of the biggest challenges I find is essentially the farther I get from Norway and the closer I get to the West Coast, you know, the word aquaculture is sometimes pretty loaded. And right, just by saying that you're in aquaculture, people get defensive. So clearly, you know, we as an industry have not done a very good job communicating what the true ecological values are in creating sustainable or even restorative proteins. Um, so no, I think, you know, we, we also need to take our share of responsibility and make sure that we're just better at telling our, our own story. Absolutely. And interestingly enough, I was just interviewing Sean O'Loughlin from the Global Aquaculture Alliance. It's specifically this same topic wherein they have to actually really be um, I guess, proactive in terms of producing education assets because half of the bottle is actually telling people how we are helpful versus detrimental to the ocean's ecology. So I totally hear what you're saying, but we're all on board, I guess, there in terms of having to educate people about what we do. So my last question to you is, um, what do you think are the top three trends that's going to happen in the aquaculture sphere in the next 10 years? Oh, wow. Uh, I don't know if I'm the qualified person to, <laughs> to, to answer that. Uh, well, I, I guess for me, what, one of whether it's aquaculture or wild catch fisheries, uh, one of the things that I uh, have, have been feeling quite uh, yeah, as I think, I think COVID really under uh, highlighted uh, particularly, but um, high valued seafood, uh, you know, premium seafood, luxury seafood, which is really not like the, the necessity proteins, but you know, the, the really premium stuff that is a, a luxury, that type of seafood being put on an airplane and flown across the world to be delivered to high paying customers. I, like I get the economics of it, you know, exotic seafood, you know, you get premium prices, it's good for business, but the carbon footprint is pretty crazy. Uh, and, and in our space, sea urchin row, right? Like our entire industry, right? Japan produces 15% of its urchin consumption. That means 85% of the urchins that they consume in, in, in Japan, uh, that has to come from the craziest corners of the world right? and flown in. And so I don't know, to me, I think one of the, one of the, if you're saying 10 years, one of the things that I would really like to see, and, and we're trying to find ways to make this happen as well, is to reduce our dependency on air freight and using, you know, RAS systems on, uh, on container vessels, for example, so that we can transport live fish, you know, using a far more uh, environmentally friendly solution, as opposed to burning that much jet fuels, just so that, you know, that that top 1% can enjoy their wonderful, you know, king crab legs. I mean, I, I love it. I, you know, don't get me wrong. It's just that, you know, I think we got to do better. Uh, so I think transport and logistics is probably one of the things uh, as more consumers become ethically and environmentally aware, I think they're going to realize that a lot of things are not as good as it should be. Um, I'm hoping that we also will see far more lower trophic ap aquaculture, meaning, you know, not you know, uh, going too deep into the predatory fish uh, uh, farming, like, you know, bluefin tuna farming, which, you know, I, I get it, you know, we don't want to tax the, the wild stocks, but, you know, that's a lot of energy that goes in uh, to, to, to produce a protein. You know, if we can go lower trophic, I think that just is a lot nicer 
to the world. Um, so I think I think those are the two that I, I wish. Uh, I don't know how quickly that'll happen, but uh, yeah, efficient and better, more environmental logistics and uh, and lower trophic aquaculture. So if we can start eating the smaller critters as opposed to the big ones, I think we'll be doing the planet a, a, a big service. Well, thank you so much, Brian. This has been a delightful interview with you. Uh, you're a gazillion of information. I love that you did drop a lot of statistics in there for our listeners <laughs> because it does give credibility in terms of what's going on out there. It's most of the time that the space is a lot more, I guess, blurred in terms of what's happening. Mm. And so numbers just give concrete, I guess, um, reality to what we're doing. So my biggest takeaway from this episode is when you were talking about taking responsibility. I think that a lot of people in whatever sphere or space or industry is just that all of us has a role and responsibility to what we're doing to protect Mother Earth. So thank you for saying that. For the next episode, we'll have Mr. Bill Taylor of Taylor Hatcheries, who will share with us the secret sauce of having six family generations of business aquaculturists. Thanks again, Brian, and I look forward to talking to you soon. All right. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Bye for now.